appreciate uh, Joe having the e you my voice. It's a little easier to talk this way. Um, but it's so good to see everyone here today. And I don't know about you, but I've really enjoyed this Pray First series we've had. We've had these wristbands, if you had them. Uh, and basically saying pray first and a reminder that everything that we do, we want to give God first. And our basic theme verse for the month of uh, January has been um, Matthew 3, 6.33. You guys put that up there. I appreciate it. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all of these things will be added. And so we believe if you give God the, the first, whatever you give God first ends up being blessed. First of your time, the first of everything you had, the first of your strength, the first of your family. You're saying, God, I'm seeking your kingdom first and the right way of doing things. And then all these things, all the things I'm concerned about, all the situations at work and the situations at home, they're all going to work out because if I put you in center, then everything else begins to align itself in its proper fashion. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And so we've been talking about that, praying first. I know I've enjoyed it. And so today we're concluding our series on Pray First. And basically, the title of today's message is How to Have Sustained Spiritual Growth. How to Have a Sustained Relationship with God that Actually Goes Someplace. How many of you have noticed this in the, in the month of January? It's very, very easy. In the month of January, to make resolutions. And some of you have done it. Uh, you know, after all those Christmas cookies, after all the stuff you ate you shouldn't have eaten over the holidays. Okay, I'm going to take uh, January. I'm going to take a fast. I'm going to get myself in shape. I'm going to do this or the other. And you try to do it the best you can, and, and you make all these resolutions. And then maybe some of you have tried some of these crazy diets where you eat rocks and grass, and you have these shakes that taste like whatever. And they have this thing called kale. I, I don't know. Everyone loves this thing. I think it's horrible. But, you know, this non-GM, I mean, it's all cool. But this kale shake or something. Have, try it. It's really good. No, it's not. You know, try these kale chips that taste terrible. Anyhow, but you try all these things, right? You try to work out at the gym. You try to do all these great things. And you do good for a while. But after a while, it's like, the heck with it. Give me a pepperoni pizza. And the next thing you know, you're, you're having pepperoni pizza. You're having a Big Mac again or going to better, better than that, Five Guys Burgers and Fries or something like that. And you're just having a good old time eating and eating and eating. And, and what happened was the frustration of, of having a diet that was not sustainable got to such a point that you're like, the heck with it. Oh, I shouldn't say heck in church. Um, forget about it. Okay. But you, that can happen very, very easily, can it? And how about physical exercise? Same thing. I'm going to get myself in the shape. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to do this, the other. You go. You, you go to the gym. You're, you're in the treadmill. And you have to, like, sign your name because there's so many people in January. They're on that treadmill. By the end of February, you have plenty. You have the place to yourself, right? <laughs> you know, people try to get in shape. And it's not sustainable. And as a result, you get discouraged with it. Or you go to a marriage conference or something like that or a financial seminar. I'm going to get my act, and it's not sustainable. You have to live on $15 a week. I'm not supposed to do that. And what happens often is we set these goals that are not realistic. They're not really achievable. And as a result, we get discouraged by it. And I believe a lot of that happens in our spiritual lives as well. Where you're, I'm going to read through the Bible. I'm going to spend an hour a day. I'm going to do this and all. And you try all that, and it's not sustainable, and you end up falling up flat. Well, the Bible does. Didn't the Bible say, be perfect as I am perfect? So we should try to be perfect. Yeah, I understand that. But sometimes we, we put these goals that are so lofty and high, they're not achievable or measurable. They're not achievable or measurable. And so today what I want to encourage you is how to have a sustained growth in God. How many of you want to have sustained growth in God? That it's not just a fad. It's not just through a season. Or how long? I mean, some of you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you... Um, Maybe your parents or maybe yourself or maybe your, your spouse comes back, I'm going to get right with God. And you're thinking, yeah, we'll see how long this lasts. This happened last year. And you, you might even tell them that, which is even horrible. I'll see how long this one lasts. I'm waiting. Ah, see, I told you, you blew your top. I knew it wasn't going to last. And you're like, the heck with it. I'm not going to do it anymore. And how many of us just get frustrated and say, you know what, I, I can't make this thing happen. I, I've tried to grow in God. I try to read my Bible. I try not to be upset. I try not to do this and the other. But I just can't seem to make it work. And, and frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated. So I'll do my best, but I don't know if I'm willing to get anywhere. And, and maybe some of you struggle with that. And I have struggled with that, by the way. And so what is a way we can get to a place where we can actually see real spiritual growth where you and I can grow in God and be at a better place than we are this year. I am confident, extremely confident in the Lord that if you will do what I'm, what I'm suggesting today, I guarantee you 
this will be a great year of spiritual growth in God, that you'll be a better person by the time January 2016 rolls around, if you will follow what I'm saying here today. And by the way, what I'm saying is not what I'm saying. It's what the Word of God talks about. I am convinced that you and I will grow and be a better person than we ever heard before. But I want to share with you a little bit, uh, a great illustration. And it happened to me. I was in graduate school and studying for Master of Divinity. And uh, I happened to live, uh, this friend of mine had a nice condo in Chesapeake, Virginia, and right on the road. And uh, one of our neighbors, his name was Julian. And this guy was like 60, but he was like, a, I mean, 60 is young. But he was, uh, he was a rock. I mean, the guy was so built. And he's, you know, you, you shake his hand, you take your hand off, you touch his arm, it's like a steel. It's incredible. And he said, yeah, I used to train Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm like, yeah, sure you did. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, sure you did. And actually, he did train Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was in that movie, Pump and Iron. He was actually, uh, he showed me a book, and it was Julian. He says, if you like, I'll train you. So I know I'm really built, and I'm really in good shape, and I, you're probably wondering how I keep this physique so excellent. Well, the same guy that trained Arnold Schwarzenegger trained me. So thanks a lot. I appreciate that. So what happened was he trained me. And uh, what I used to do is go to the gym, and I'd do the treadmill, do this. And there's no system. I'd just do whatever. And some of us, that's what our spiritual lives are like. Oh, I'll read the Bible. I'll go to church. I'll do this, the other. And you don't find any sustained growth. So, no, we need to get a program. So you need to find a time. You need to set a time. I want you to do uh, five days a week uh, and two days off. And you have to let your body to rest. So we did Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays was, was chest, back, and triceps. That was what we did. And so I'd get on the bench press, and I, I was terrible. I was about uh, 110 pounds. I was like, Argh! And this girl next to me is going, whoosh, 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 whoosh. well, I just got it off. I got a motorcycle wreck, and I mixed something up. But anyhow, that's when I used to lie. But anyhow, so uh, he trained me, and, and he gave me on his regiment, and I took it seriously. And I had my schedule. It was a non-negotiable, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I would go at 6 in the morning. I'd go to the gym. I'd do all this, and i stopped eating a lot of fatty foods. Let me tell you something. I bulked up quick. I mean, I was, I was about um, 165 pounds, <clears throat> and... Uh, and I could bench 230 pounds and do it 10 times. I mean, that's, I was in good shape. I could run two, three miles, no problem. And I was, you know, I was, I was, the, I was to be caught, you know. My wife found me. So anyhow, and uh, I got in good shape. And it was great. And it was feeling fantastic. But about six to nine months goes by, and I noticed I wasn't getting any more progress. I was like, man, I'm, I'm still doing the same stuff, but I'm losing it. What's going on? And I said, Julian, I he said, you've got to change up your routine. I said, what do you mean? Your, your muscles are used to it. Try something to do, now do lap pullovers and do a different bench press and do something different. And so as I started to do that, I started to grow again. But the, the thing that I really helped me to grow physically and, I, and I, well, I should go back to the gym again, is, is to have a consistent time. In a spiritual life, it's very much like that. It really is. So many of us have no plan. We just hope and think, I'm going to grow in God. Why? Well, I go to church, and I'm just going to go to church, and somehow or another, I'm going to go to church, I'm going to grow all by myself. But I have found, and the Bible talks about this, that you ha in order to grow in God, there's some things that you and I absolutely have to do. That sounds, like a, that sounds religious, and God's about freedom. Well, we'll talk about that in a few moments. But I want to help you today to set some patterns that are sustainable, sustainable patterns that will help you and I grow and make 2015 the best spiritual life we've ever had. How many would like to have the best spiritual life you've ever had? Absolutely. And by the way, when your spiritual life is good, everything is good because your spirit lasts forever. It's so important to get right with God. And so the first thing I want to say to you is this. Um, sustainable growth in God. Matthew 6, And Listen, if you don't memorize the Scripture, as I said earlier, please memorize the Scripture. If you don't memorize Scripture, please memorize the Scripture. Seek first the kingdom of God. It's, it's so important. So important. And just like diet and exercise, there are tremendous parallels between that. Uh, that same thing. So here's my point today. And if you want to get in shape, and again, I, I'm talking physically and spiritually. If you want to get in shape physically, uh, and you try all these crash diets. How many people know what I'm talking about? You, know, you buy the butt master. Remember that, Suzanne Summers? You buy this cheap apparatus that you, is supposed to make you look like uh, whatever. You buy the uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger or, or what are you, Chuck Norris gym, and you buy these things, and about three years later, you see it at a garage sale for five bucks. You, you know, you know and, they, and they had these little shoes you could slide on this thing. Remember that guy? You slide on it. And you had some guy with a, with a ponytail, and he be screaming, all right, everybody. You know, you watch this, you buy the video, and you're all gun ho and it just ends up being a garage sale. And I have a friend of mine, 
that uh, you go to his house, he has the best equipment. He's got a Nautilus system. He's got free weights. He's got uh, two treadmills, actually three treadmills, bicycles, whites, and he does not go on them at all. I said, can I have that? No, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start doing it. He's been telling me that for over 10 years. And so many of us are the same way spiritually. Well, how do we see it happen? And we, often we look for a magic wand, don't we? We're thinking, I, I need a magic wand. I God, if I just find a secret thing, if I'll just come to church and I'll hear a good sermon, or the person will pray for me, then I'm going to grow in God. And you know what I've found? Growth usually comes step by step. Real growth, real sustainable growth. And so how do we do that? How do, how do we go forward? How do we move forward? Well, first of all, I want to say this. Spiritual growth in Christ is a lifestyle choice. Just like physically, you can't really get in shape and sustain it. A lot of people have yo-yo diets. You know, you do all this and you go back down. Your, your cholesterol level gets them. Some of you, it makes me, some of you can eat whatever you want to eat. And you're still skinny. And, and, but your cholesterol levels might be bad. You go to the doctor and, uh, and he might say, you're, you're real high. You have to change your diet. So you change your diet and you get better. I and mean, you're like, this is, this is terrible. I want to live. Yeah. Let me have some uh, Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Anyhow, so you, you try all that. But what is sustainable is this. You have to... Um, it has to be a lifestyle that, a choice, a lifestyle change. You have to say, okay, I'm going to make my life revolve around my spiritual health in God. It has to become a lifestyle choice, just like it is physically. If you want to get in shape physically, you have to make a lifestyle choice. Otherwise, it's going to be a fad spiritual diet, a fad spiritual situation. So that's the first thing. It has to be a lifestyle change, you know. It, um, life in God is not a 100-yard dash. If I went to the New York, New York Marathon, and let's say I decided to run, and I got to the front somehow, so okay, I'm going to get this thing. And the gun goes off, or whatever they shoot off, and I run as fast as I can. I sprint as hard as I can. Chances are I'll be in the front of the pack. I'm in front of the whole New York uh, Marathon. But how many folks know after about 120 yards, I'm going to be holding my side, panting for breath, and I'm not going to be able to run anymore. And the next thing you know, everyone's running past me. So many times you and I have, we have disciplined ourselves, and we have fallen short, and we're, we're discouraged, we're out of breath. But how do you do it? You're better off having sustained spiritual growth. You're better off having every single day 20 minutes than having uh, one day a week. You come to church and you eat all you can and you hope the buffet is going to last you. It doesn't work that way. You have to do it every single day. So it's no, there's no magic wand. And I have found we often, especially in our traditions, uh, come of various traditions, there's various different ways it happen. Some people don't like to pay the price. It costs something. Disciple means discipline. I hate to tell you this, but there, you need discipline in order to we say, I have no discipline. Well, you, have, you have discipline. No, I don't. Yes, you do. You have, you have a level of discipline because you wouldn't be here if you didn't have any discipline. So you have discipline enough to get out of bed, and you, but it's absolutely essential. And some people don't want to pay the price, and sadly, they end up paying a higher price for not doing that. And I read a book called How Great Men and Women Fall. It was absolutely amazing. And they talked about these profile, and this, this, this researcher, the research team, studied these great men and women, some in the religious community, pastors and things like that, and some in business world, like Enron and things like that. And they found what makes them successful and what makes them fall. And what makes, every time I read about a great pastor or a prominent person falling in embezzlement of funds or immorality or something like that, always, I'm telling you, all the time, this is what happens, my personal time with God was not happening. They preached, they'll, they'll prepare for their sermons, they'll do this and the other, but their own quiet time with God was lacking. They're not praying, they're not reading the Word of God, and they have no accountability, and they find them falling like flies. My friends, this is something that will help sustain us. There's no reason you and I have to fall. There's no reason why you and I have to fail. God has a good thing for us. But there's something I want to say about uh, the whole area of spiritual growth. There's one group of people I call the uh, avoid the straight jacket discipline. These are the people that, I'm not this way. There's some people that I know, they're really organized. And they have everything by a list. A, B, C, they have everything. At 7, at 7 o'clock, they wake up. And by the time they get to the kitchen, at 7.05, they get the Cheerio box out. At, at 7.08, it's poured into the bowl and milk is there. At 7.10, the raisins are being dropped on the cereal and the toast is in the, uh, in the toaster. And by 7.10, they finished. And by 7.15, they're brushing their teeth. And by 7.45, the garage door is opening and they're on their way listening 
the caliph. Okay, so, and they have everything figured out, and everything is regimented, and they're so good about it. I mean, they, they come early, everything's set, everything's organized. You're like, man, I can never be that way. But at the same time, if you mess with them, they're all freaked out. Oh, you, you ruined my schedule. And so there comes a point in time where you think that if you discipline yourself, listen, the reason we have the discipline is it is not the end. The discipline is not the end. It is a means to coming to know Christ. But when your ability to discipline yourself becomes the end, okay, I prayed today, check. Went to church this week, check. Tithe, check. I helped the old lady cross the street, check. Whatever you do, right, you did all these things, check. I told my wife I loved her, check. And okay, I did everything. Okay, praise God. And, and, and you think that's enough. And, you, and what happens is you can start worshiping the strategies and you can start worshiping the structure. Listen, a lot of us grew up in various traditions. It comes Catholic, Roman Catholic, some uh, uh, various traditions. And if you notice, the reason why they have, uh, by the way, in the Catholic Church, they have the, the incense and the priest will come and wave it. And you're like, why do they have all these things? Well, that was there as a reason. That was a discipline to help people realize the incense represented the prayers. And so it was a visual reminder that you'd smell it and it would help you draw close to God. Because it would be a reminder that your prayers are like incense. Now, what can happen is you start, you care more about the incense burner, you care more about the robes, you care more about the paraphernalia, that you actually forget about God, and it's more about these systems that you're doing. And this can happen with people like that. And, and it, you know, there's nothing wrong about doing it the right way. But you have to be careful. And another thing is this. There are those that are free birds. Hey, man, I'm a free bird. Just like that Leonard Skinner song. I'm just a free bird. And so I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And, hey, listen, you know, that's, you know, the discipline and, and, and theology, that's, that's for those, uh, those, are the, those, were those uh, you know, those dead people. We believe that the Holy Spirit would show up. And they believe, these folks, you know, I'm, I'm exaggerating, of course, to make a point. They believe that if a pastor does not prepare for his sermon and comes up, the Spirit of God comes upon him or her, and then it's anointed. But you can't plan. So planning is not good. And so you have to let the spirit flow and, and all that. And, hey, man, I'm going to let it flow. I call them the hippie Christians. Hey, man, you know, hey, peace, peace. And they're not smoking anything, but they, they act like they are. Anyhow, and so they tend to think that way. And they tend to think, hey, just, it's going to happen all by itself. But God is a God of order and structure. I mean, look at it. The sun comes up a certain time. It sets, and the earth rotates around the sun, and there's seasons. and everything. God is a God of order. And order will help give you freedom. But if you worship the order, it gets you into religious bondage. And so the same as this whole thing, hey, I, whatever the Lord does, he does. I'm going to let him, and it's, try doing this, married men. Try taking your wife out and say, okay, at the last minute you call her up, and she's had plans all week. Hey, honey, we're going to go on a date tonight. I'm going out to, no, we're going to go on a date. Where are we going to go? I don't know. You get in the car. You say, where are we going to go to eat? I don't know. You go, I don't know. Where are you going to go? I don't know. <laughs> and, you, and you say that to her, and, and you make no plans, and you're like, well, I don't know where a restaurant I'm going to go to. I don't know. And you want to go to a restaurant, and they're, they're, you know, you make no reservations. The one you like is packed out. It doesn't work out. It, it helps when you make plans, right? If you want to have a successful marriage, it's important to have plans. And you just can't decide, okay, I'm going to go on vacation. Well, what plans do you have? I don't know. You have to make plans. I'm going to buy a house. Okay. Have you saved? No. I, say, I don't know. And you, know, you have to make plans. There's nothing wrong with planning. But within our plans, we need spontaneity. Then when God says something, we say yes to it, all right? And there's a difference between it. And there's something to be said about that. Now, I'm going to share with you uh, something extraordinarily important, all right? How many of you have jobs? Okay? If you don't have a job, read the book of job. It's great. All right? All right, so you go to a job. How many folks can just go like this? They say you beat her at 9 o'clock. And you say, you know, you're rolling about 12. How you doing, boss? Hey, you know what? I didn't feel like... The Spirit didn't touch me this morning. I don't really feel like going to, to work till 12. You get fired, right? Or how about this? You're going to meet your boss, and this is an opportunity, unless you're, uh, you, this is an opportunity for you to get a, uh, a, a review and a pay raise. And, and you need to come to this thing at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and you're going to meet with your boss, and he's going to give you an opportunity for a pay raise and all that. And how many, hey, you know, what? I, I, you come at 2.30, hey, boss, how you doing? Well, you know, I, I just felt the Spirit touch me, and I decided to pray a little longer. Well, you lost your opportunity, right? There has to be structure. There has to be something that you do. And often the spiritual way is too. And I want to say, well, not only do you have to make a lifestyle choice, but there's something we have to do. Number one is this. You have to have a daily quiet time with God just for you and God and you and God alone. When should it be? 
there's certain people that wake up in the morning and go, good God, it's morning. And those people drive you crazy. And then there's other people that go, good God, it's morning. Now, which one do you fall on? If you're the good God, it's morning. Okay, probably the morning is the best time for you to have your time with God. Maybe if you're going, good God, it's morning, then you're probably better off having the afternoon or the evening. But let me challenge you, everyone here today, about to do this. When you put your foot out of the bed and get your foot in the ground, I want to challenge every one of you to take about 35 to uh, 85 seconds and say, Father, today I dedicate this day to you. This is not my day. This is your day. I'm not living for you. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not living for myself. It's a Freudian slip. I'm sorry. See, I need it. that's why I'm up here for it. This is, I'm, I'm a sitting, okay. So you say, okay, God, I'm, this day is for you. I, I dedicate this day to you. God, I ask you to bless me as I go on. Okay? Dedicate your day to the Lord. And there's something to be said about, says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You make a declaration, a proclamation when you get out of bed. It's important to do that. Now, if you're not able to, 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 to pray and have your quiet time, then find what it works for you. If it's at lunch, if it's driving your car, uh, do me a favor. Don't be Pentecostal when you're driving your car. Keep your hands on the wheel, not in the air. All right? Um, so just be careful with that. But maybe it's driving. Maybe it's having lunch. Maybe it's winter, or lunchtime. Maybe it's at, at dinner before you go to bed. I don't know. Whatever time is your best, what's your best time, give to God. Give your best time to God. I happen to like the morning best. Once I have my cup of coffee, okay? And uh, so uh, it means you, you means you have, no, I pray first, and then I have my cup of coffee. All right, here we go. But uh, give your God the best portion of the day. And no matter what time, give him the best. But Jesus says in Matthew 6, he says, when you pray. He doesn't say, if you pray. He says, when you pray. And we see Jesus, what he does. He says he got up and went to a quiet, lonely place. Jesus would often be having great success, and he would leave the business, and he would get by himself and pray. When he heard that John the Baptist, his cousin, was killed, he went by himself to pray. When he preached a long period of time, he said, let's get away. Well, Jesus said, no, let's get away. He'd take him to a resort area of Fessary Philippi to be alone, to recharge their, his batteries. And so I want to encourage you a couple things. Make this time with God a non-negotiable time. If, for example... If you set your devotional time at 7 o'clock and someone says, hey, let's go to breakfast. I'm sorry, I have an appointment. I can't make it. Make it a non-negotiable time that this is the time between you and God. And if you do have to break it, set another time. And so in other words, don't let it happen. Isn't it amazing? We, we, we do things that are not that important, but the most important relationship in your life, make it a non-negotiable time. There's a couple of things I want to encourage you about doing this time, all right? It's very, very important. First of all, get a time and get a place. There's something about having a sanctified place. Jesus would go, um, when he was in the Jerusalem area, he would go to the Mount of Olives and he would pray. He said, it's in the scripture, he would often go there to pray. And I've actually been there to the Mount of Olives. I've actually looked over Jerusalem. What a great place to pray. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he'd be there, he'd be interceding, he'd be praying. That was his place. Find your place. Maybe it's an armchair in the corner of the house. Maybe it's in your, maybe it's in your office before people come in. You know, mine's becoming my office over here now. I'll just lock the door, but do, do not disturb. And people know, unless someone's bleeding, don't leave me alone. I'm, I'm with God. This is my time to, to touch God, and this is my time to hear from God. So you need that non, non-negotiable time where you're not going to make any compromise. It's the most important thing you do during the day. I, this is what I have found. I found, this is to be true, in my own personal life, I have found out that if I have my time with God and I connect with God, then no matter how the day goes, I go to bed feeling like I accomplished something worthwhile. Seriously. How many people know what I'm talking about? You, you, you get out of bed, you're late, and all day long you're running behind schedule with the Lord, and you, and you feel like you never have control of your day. When you give God the best part of your day, he helps you through the rest of your day. So set a time, set a place, and have a plan. Well, I just let the spirit flow. Really? Okay. Nothing wrong with letting the spirit flow, but you need structure for it to flow. A pool is only good if you have a structure to, fill, to hold the water in the pool. That structure gives you freedom. Without structure, there's no freedom. Just like the roads out there. You know, the fact that we have stoplights and, and, and speedometer and all that, I mean, and, and um, speed limits and all that, that gives you freedom to drive your car. Without that, if you've ever been to a Latin American country like Guatemala, or, or, or someplace like that, and I, I've been to a place, Guatemala, and uh, I love the people, but they drive crazy. There's no rules. And it, it's mayhem. It's, it's, it's uh, dangerous. 
So you, you need to have a structure and you need a plan. And so Jesus said this in Matthew 6. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and the corners and streets. But you, when you pray, go into your room. See, you say, go to your room, go to a place. Shut the door and pray in private. And you know, I just, I need my time with God. I encourage you to do that. All right, do that. And by the way, don't set yourself to go an hour and a half if you can't do it. Why don't you do something sustainable? Give yourself 20 minutes. And in that 20 minutes, give yourself 15 and a five-minute buffer zone for being distracted, <laughs> okay? Do, do that. Well, I can do more than that while you're doing it. You're better off having 15 minutes a day than coming to church for three hours on Sunday. I mean, I'm telling you, every single day, get before God. Well, what do you do? What do you read? Have a plan. Have a place. Have a plan. And what's a good plan? You know what? The Bible is so powerful. I encourage you to do that. And what is that? That's the word. It's the four essentials. I'm going to ask you to put the Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The Word of God is absolutely essential to read the Word of God. I can't read. When listen to the Word of God, there's so much technology today you can do. What does the Bible say? <clears throat> it says, for the Word of God is living and powerful. The Word of God is not yesterday's news. It is living and powerful. If you know what I'm talking about, for those of you that are believers and have done this for years, you know what I'm talking about. You're reading the Word of God, and it reads you. Something jumps off the page. It speaks to you. It gives you insight. It's amazing. It's absolutely, you know, it's, it's living. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit. And joints. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. And so what happens is it helps you discern. It helps you know what's right and wrong. And if you progressively keep on going into the Word every single day, after a while, you begin to get filled with the Word. And so something happens, you know. The Bible also says in Psalm 119, 105, Your Word is a lamp unto my feet. It is a lamp. So that's the first thing I want to encourage you. Listen, if you've never read the Bible before, I encourage you to get a Bible you actually can understand. We have some free Bibles we'll give you, uh, New Testaments, so and we can give you a Bible. And one of the ones I happen to like for reading, I like the New Living Translation. It, it, it's good. It's readable. It's, it's fairly accurate. You know, it, it's, it's accurate. It's, it's, a para, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a translation of the Word of God. It's pretty accurate. Um, and... Uh, and so get one you can understand. Maybe it's New King James, New Century Version, English Standard, English Standard Version is a really good one, ESV, or New King James I happen to like. But get one you can actually understand what it says. The King James, by the, I, I, I'm going to get off on this, but the King James was, was back in the 1600s. There are translations today that have an older text where they translate than they had in the King James. Okay, so if you're old King James only, that's fine. But get a, a version you understand. What I also encourage you to do as well is to start with, a new, if you've never read before, start with the New Testament. Start with Matthew. Take 15 minutes. Ask God to open your eyes. Get a pen and underline when you get something that, that jumps out at you. Another thing I've found in that quiet place, I like to bring a pad of paper or uh, everything's electronic for me now, but I'll have a little to-do list. And invariably, as I'm studying, oh, my gosh, I got I to gotta see her today at 3 o'clock. Uh, uh, you know, this person's going for surgery. I need to give him a call. I forgot all about that. Oh, I, I got to do this. The other. Oh, I bring the kids to soccer practice. Oh, I got to do this. And I'll think of all these things that I have to do that I didn't think of. I'm like, oh. And all during my prayer, I'm thinking, I don't want to forget. I don't want to forget. Well, the best thing to do is just write it down. Okay, soccer today at 3. Call this about this. And I write them down. And what happens is the distraction gets out of my head. Now I can focus. The enemy used to remind me of all these things. Now he doesn't bother anymore because I write them down. I'm more efficient. <laughs> so, you know, have that there. And, and then pray, God, open my eyes. Now, we're also doing, we're going through the Bible in a year as a church. And I go through the Bible almost every year for the last 15 years or so. I've gone through the Bible probably 20 times or more. And it's a blessing because I, I, I don't pick the passages I want to pick. I read the whole Bible. And it covers areas I would not normally go to. And the Lord will speak to me through the Word every, day, every single day. I want to encourage you to go on Facebook, and you can check with us, and you can follow along. There's a, there's a group that meets here on uh, Sunday evenings, I believe, at 6, right over here, right, Kent and Terry McClung, and then they get together, and they go through the Bible in a year. So, you know, well, if you forget a day, don't worry about it. Just pick up where you left off. But I'm telling you, get in the Word every single day. It will speak to you. It, let me tell you, it is miraculous what God will do through the Word. So that's the second, first thing is the Word. The second thing is prayer. And we've been talking about that. You know, see, I mentioned this before, but it's a good illustration. 
The word is like wood, and prayer is like fire. If you don't have good wood, you start throwing junk on the fire. So when you read the word of God, you have seasoned wood. You put it on the fire, and the wind is like the Holy Spirit, okay? So you have fire, you have fire, and you have wind. And when it comes together, you have a burning, a healthy, burning spiritual life. I want to encourage you with that. It's prayer. The Bible says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. And God wants us to be in a prayerful mode. It doesn't mean you pray all day long as we've been saying for weeks now. It means that you have God in walkie-talkie mode. You don't hit end call. You say, you leave it on walkie. If you know what a walkie-talkie is, it's always on. And they can, just, they can say, hey, John, how you doing? You know, hey, Breaker 1-9, remember that? And, and you can always have it on. So believe that. So and that's extraordinarily important. So a place... A time, okay, um, get into the Word, get into prayer, get into time of, of another one is, is fellowship with other believers. It's so important to be in fellowship. Christianity, real Christianity, a life in Christ is not an individual sport. It's a team sport. Now, these football players, like Tom Brady, uh, I'm sure he's practicing taking air out of balls. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. But anyhow, he's practicing uh, throwing his football all through the week. Okay, that's good. He's doing that. That's important. He, he does all the things he has to do, so when the game time comes, he's ready. But the reason he's doing it is so he can play on a team. And what happens is your daily devotion time is important so that when you come together with your church, you can become part of the team. This is not a theatrical performance. This is an opportunity for us to grow together and go together. And so what happens is, the Bible says, and please you know, open your Bibles uh, to put to... Uh, Hebrews 10, 24. Here he goes. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Now, what would happen if we had a marriage like that? What would happen if you tried to motivate your spouse to, to acts of love and, and things that would help? Wouldn't well, that be a good thing? Uh, motivate to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do. It says in another scripture, it says, have a habit. But encourage one another, especially now that the day his return is drawing near. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer is any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There is only a terrible expectation of God's judgment and raging fire what will consume his enemies. What? I never heard that before. Yeah. Is that one saved always? I'm not going to get into that. Do you, do you want to test it? I don't. Listen, we've got to help each other out here. It's easy to fall away. But when we are together as a team, you know, as a team, it's easy to pick one off. It's, I, my old pastor used to say, it's like, you know, being in the church is like bananas. I said, yeah, I get that. He says, well, if you're not in the bunch, you get picked, peeled, and eaten. You're going to stay in the bunch. So it's important to stay in the bunch and, and make a habit and make it a priority to every day have a non-negotiable time with God. Make it a priority. Come to church at least once a week on Sunday. And then make it a priority to connect with other believers on more than a one-on-one -on -one or two or three in, on a smaller basis, we can actually have interaction where people actually know your name and know what you're going through, get involved with a small group. And small groups are only mechanisms to help you connect with other people. It's not about small groups. It's about connecting. And so we have an opportunity for you to get involved with various small groups. And if you don't have a small group, we'll make one for you. So I encourage you to get involved with small groups. It's very important. And then finally, reaching out to others. You have to reach out to others. Not just do it yourself, but now how can I affect someone else? How can I give what I've learned to bless somebody else? My friends, I'm convinced. I know you might be thinking, this is so like, this is like C-spot run type of sermon. You know what? The C-spot run things of Christianity, the essential to Christianity is what makes you grow. Because everything I mentioned to you, you can go very deep. There's no end to the depth of reading God's Word. There's no end to the depth of prayer. There's no end to the depth of fellowship with God's people. There's no end to the depth of, um, depth of reaching out in His power. And you and I, if you commit yourself, to these four things, make it a non-negotiable. I am going to have, and, and by the way, if you mess up, give yourself some slack, please. There's been days that I, I, I mess up, I, I get, uh, something happens, I get, something emergency happens, or something like that, and I, I, I'm at the end of the day and I have my devotions yet. I'm like, oh, God, I'm sorry. I really feel it. And I don't, I don't feel like God's angry with me. No, I feel like I've missed out because I'm missing the source of my strength. 
so when I miss my devotions, I don't think God's angry at me. I don't feel guilty. I feel like, I feel like man, I missed it. You know what I'm talking about? You know, like you miss your favorite TV show. Oh, I missed it today. Well, a lot better than that. You miss your time with God. I notice. And what can happen is if you do not have that time with him every day, after a while, you don't care anymore. So I want to encourage you with that. I'm going to ask if Esteban make his way up as we prepare ourselves for communion, reaching out to others. Listen, one of the things I, I want to encourage you to do also, when you get together, when you have time with God, there's something you need to do. And I want to encourage you. We have these books called Pray First. I'll go ahead and grab it. Um, we have them in the, in the lobby on the information desk. This will help you to know how to pray, okay? I'm not going to go through it right now, um, but this will give you some tools to know how to pray. The Lord's Prayer is one of them, all right? And then we know it. I'll just go through it quickly. The Lord's Prayer really is a bullet point of how to pray. Go ahead and pass the elements out, please. What does it say? This is how you should pray. Our Father who art in heaven. So go to God and worship. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what are you praying about first? You're praying about God's will. Give me this day my daily bread. It doesn't say give me this day my weekly bread. It says daily bread, which means God wants us to come to him every single day asking him for his word to take care of what we need. Give us this day our daily bread. All right? And what does it say? Lead us not into temptation. When it says what? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then you pray what? You pray about this, Lord, forgive me like I forgive others. So that's what you should do. Say, God, is there anyone that I'm bitter towards? Is there anyone that I have not forgiven? And that's really powerful to do that. And so um, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us as we forgive others. God, how do I forgive somebody else? And so every day you've got to ask yourself. Now, I love what it says here in the Scripture. Psalm 139, 23 to 24. Please put that up there. The Bible says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. Isn't it nice to know that King David had anxiousness? And see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. I'm not suggesting we have introspection. This is what I have found. When I introspect, it never is healthy. When I become introspective, either I become proud, look how good I have it, or I become discouraged because it's all about me evaluating me. What I encourage you to do is this. Have God inspection. Holy Spirit, God. What does it say? Search me, O oh God. It doesn't say search myself. It says search me, O oh God. Say, hey, God, I understand that I don't know everything. I understand that I don't understand everything. It says what? Search me, O God. The Bible says the heart is wicked above all else. Who can know it? You see, you and I, you can't trust yourself without God. So say, God, search my heart. God, is there anything in me that's wicked? Now, if, I, if someone irritates me, which can happen once in a while, someone says something to me, does something, oh, that person, oh, I'll tell you what. God, search my heart. How come I'm upset at Jim? I'm just making this up. Why am I upset at Jack or Jim, whoever it is? God, search my heart. Father, if I feel like once in a while, I feel like I don't feel appreciated at the church. God, let me ask you, God, search my heart. God, I don't feel appreciated. God, search my heart. Why don't I feel appreciated? Well, because you're, you're finding your identity in your job instead of your identity in me. Okay, God, I'm sorry. God, forgive me that I'm looking for people to give me purpose when it should be coming from you. You see, see how that works? So search me, oh God. Try my heart. And that's the power of having God in inspection, not introspection. Big difference. And then pray. Listen, if you would do these things, let me say it again. Determine in your heart and mind, I'm going to have a non-negotiable daily time with God. Not negotiable, I'm going to have it. Time, a place, and a plan. Commit yourself to to come to church every single week and commit yourself to at least one other activity with other believers that you can have interaction and begin to go through life together and then reach out. If you'll do those four things, I guarantee you, money back guarantee, you will grow in Christ in 2015. It's that simple, but it will change your life. It's changed my life, and it's changing my life. You can ask me, what was your devotions yesterday? 
and I'll be able to pull up my journal and say, this is what I learned yesterday. We should be able to have something new every single day. I encourage you with this. Again, this is not have to. You get to. This is not God's upset with you. No, God wants you to grow and be strong. So Jesus, when he did, Jesus was broken on our behalf. I don't know if you realize that. Just by his wounds were made healed. And I don't know where you are today, but as some of us grew up in the Catholic traditions and, and they teach and they teach that this is literally the body of Christ and, and they take a lot of reverence for that, which I really appreciate. But sometimes in our traditions of, of Protestants and or evangelical, we think, ah, it's just, it's just a cracker. Ah, it's just grape juice. Ah, whatever. Ah, chew on it and don't think anything. No. This represents the body of Christ. And I, we believe in this church that Christ's presence is here. This may not be his body, but it represents his presence. And everything about God, Jesus, is about the forgiveness of sins. And by his wounds, we're made healed. So let's just, let's just pray right now today. I'm going to ask you to hold the element up as an act of faith. I'm going to pray. The Bible says he was broken that we'd be made whole. Maybe there's a situation in your life that you need healing from. Maybe it's a physical thing. Let's just pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask, God, as before we take these elements, we thank you that your body was broken for us. God, I pray that anyone suffering any kind of sickness, Lord, we thank you that by your stripes we're healed, Lord. Ultimately we're healed, but we also believe that you heal today as well. Thank you for healing other people. And before we go any further, before you take communion, I want to say this. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, now's the time to do it. What it simply is is this. It's saying, Jesus, I have, I'm sorry. I've sinned against you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I make you the Lord of my life. I believe you are the Son of God and you died on the cross. And I would live for you from this point forward. I'm no longer the boss. You're the boss. That's all it takes to begin the journey. So let's pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for me. You paid for my sins. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And I choose this day to make you my Savior and my Lord. I choose to have you to be the boss of my life. I no longer call the shots, but I do whatever you say I will do. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me the power to walk out what I just prayed in Jesus' name. If you prayed that for the first time, you just began a new journey with God. Take, eat, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, healing would come across this place right now. Father, anyone suffering from any kind of uh, um, sickness, we pray for healing, God. And those watching in live stream, pray for healing, God, in Jesus' name. After they supped, he took the wine. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. What Jesus did was enough. Take all. Let's all stand, please. Can we just have a closing song at the, at the cross, maybe? I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way up. If you need prayer for anything at all, we want to encourage you to come up for prayer. Let me just pray one, one, one last blessing. Father, I just thank you for today. Lord, I just pray that we would take what we heard today, God, that we would make non-negotiable time with you, that we would say, God, I'm going to devote myself to daily time with you that's non-negotiable. Lord, I, I devote myself to being a part of church every week. I devote myself to being part of other believers and learning how to grow and reaching out. Thank you, Father. I pray you bless us, Lord. I pray that 2015 would be the best year we've ever had in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. And listen, thank you so much. I encourage you to continue. Let's grow in God together. Amen? Let's have that last song. We could. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in awe of you. I'm in awe of you. Your love ran red and my sin washed away. I owe all to you. I owe all to you at the cross, at the cross, at the cross. I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where you love. In my sin washed white, I owe to you, I owe to you, I owe.
Amen. May God bless you today as you go forth. Come on, let's grow together, guys. Let's encourage each other. If you need prayer at all, please go forward. We have a class 101. You're welcome to come. God bless you.